Hello Tech Fans and welcome in to episode 121 of the Tech Sideline Podcast originating from TSL's High Tech Studios in the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center. What a special show that we have for you all as we record on Wednesday morning, February 26th, episode 121. We have Virginia Sports Hall of Famer David Teal joining the Tech Sideline Podcast to talk about Virginia Tech football, Virginia Tech basketball, fun questions to get to as well. All that and more coming up on episode 121 of the Tech Sideline Podcast brought to you by the Fisher Law Firm. Let's get it started right now. And with that, we say good morning and thanks so much for joining us, whether you're watching live on Facebook, watching on YouTube, listening on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, however you consume the Tech Sideline Podcast. We are so glad that you could join us this morning. Evan Hughes alongside our general manager and founder, Will Stewart. Will, how are you doing this morning? Doing well. I'm waiting for you to call Malcolm the best producer in the land and for me to dispute it after the uh, (laughs) technical snafu on the last show. He may may have to earn his title back. (laughs) He's going to earn it back. He is the best producer in the land. We have Malcolm Stewart behind the scenes producing each and every Tech Sideline podcast. And again, on the podcast set, Virginia Sports Hall of Famer, David Teal. David, thank you so much for being here. It means the world to us. My pleasure. Uh, It's a a big deal. I wore a collared shirt and Uh I shaved this morning. So. Uh Yeah, when, I, when I went to pick him up, he was ready to go. He walked oh. out in the parking lot. He was excited. <laughs> yeah. I, I woke up 20 minutes before my alarm this morning just because I was so excited for this podcast. <laughs> I will, will, you've been excited for this as well. Now, so the fans know David went through a lot to get here. Had a flat tire on, was it 81 or 64? Uh, 295 bypass in oh, Richmond gosh. at rush hour. <laughs> oh, that, that's right by short pump when you're coming up. Yes, yeah, so I, I was about six miles short of uh, short pump and caught some road debris and had to pull that sucker over, and uh, I was not going to change it in with my back to oncoming traffic. No, Just a little skittish. So, yeah, I was, I, so he risked life and limb to be here. <laughs> yeah. So was it was it a dramatic TV thing where you heard a bang and the car started pulling away? Really? Absolutely. Wow. Oh, the noise was horrific. And then when I pulled over, I mean, you could hear the air coming out of the tire, and you could see this hook that was oh. embedded in the wow. tire. So I knew I wasn't going anywhere for a while. So on a related note, have you ever (laughs) seen, you know how tires are always exploding on uh, on tractor trailers? Have you ever been next to one when that happened? No, thank goodness. We took an an RV trip cross country way back in 2013, and and there was a a 18-wheeler right in front of us where one of those tires went. And it sounds like a gunshot. I mean, it goes bang and it starts flying off. And I had never experienced that. So uh, we're glad you made it here. Yes. As am I. Yeah. Yep. I was actually thinking maybe it was on 81. 295 by 64. I know that place. That is a, would not want that to happen there at all. Yeah. So I'm glad you are okay. and glad the car is okay. Uh, and again, we're so glad to have you with us here on the Tech Sideline podcast. Again, brought to you by the Fisher Law Firm. Uh, David, we... We both want to start by, I, I think, on behalf of us here at TSL and the entire really fans across the Commonwealth of Virginia, congratulating you on your new role at the Richmond Times Dispatch covering college basketball. Uh, congratulations! We're so thrilled for you. Thanks. It's a uh, it's a gig for the the rest of the season uh, through the ACC and probably the NCAA tournaments, and we'll we'll see what happens after that. I I left the Daily Press after thirty six. Great years. It just seemed like the the right time. Uh, I don't think it's any secret that our corporate owner, Tribune Publishing out of Chicago, was offering chain-wide severance packages to folks who had been working there for eight years or longer. And I just thought at my stage in, in life, it was time for me to move on. Yeah, well, I think you're going to have a lot of options. So you do have a lot of irons in the fire right now. And- I, I do. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's next and have reached out to some folks and some others have reached out to me and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what the future holds. I very much want to stay in the fray. Uh, the ACC is my wheelhouse. Virginia right. is my wheelhouse, the, the, the Commonwealth. And uh, while I'm, I may be 60 years old, I've got a third grader, guys. I'm not ready to retire. So I saw you. I saw you at the Belk Bowl, and you had covered UVA in the Orange Bowl the night before. Correct. 
and had and I will remind everybody the Belk Bowl was at noon in Charlotte the next day, yeah. and you and you did both. Um, I hope that your next gig doesn't require you <laughs> to work two days in a row on an hour's sleep. Well, I, my former gig didn't require me. The, 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 there's a there's a part of me that. If there's a big event that people are talking about, and I know the Belt Bowl was not the Orange Bowl, but Virginia Tech football is what resonates most with our audience. Yeah. And I just felt like I I wanted to be there. And plus it was it was Bud's farewell. If it had just been maybe a routine Belk Bowl, maybe not. That game turned out to be a lot more engrossing than I expected oh my gosh. with the pregame fisticuffs, and and that that was a nasty, hard fought game. Every, no, it was it was really compelling theater. Yeah, it was. And to be down on the I, we went down on the field for the last drive, and it just felt inevitable. Yeah, it yeah, was, I know. It it really did. I mean, very early on in that, you just felt like. The Hokies can't stop. You knew where it was going. And when they picked up that first four, and we talked about this on the podcast, when Kentucky picked up that first fourth down on that drive, I thought, yeah, the rest is going through the motions. I know where this is going. Yeah. yeah. Did that feel a little bit like the Notre Dame game at all? Yes. Oh, yeah. In fact, I was not at the Notre Dame game. I was at Virginia's game in Chapel Hill that night, but we were watching uh, in the press box, and I said to someone, when Notre Dame got the ball back, I just looked at them and said, 21-20. Mm-hmm. I said, that's how this one's going to. So hopefully they'll fix that in the coming years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, again, Dave, we're thrilled for you. Uh, Richmond Times-Dispatch, you know, the, uh, the the editors, everybody was tweeting about it when it first came out. There's a <laughs> there's a great deal out right now, again, to access just, just a dollar to read the great content that you yeah, have. Yeah, a, a dollar for eight weeks, which seems to me a bargain at twice the price. And that will get you that will get you through the NCAA tournament. If yeah. You, yeah. All right. Yeah. So I, I, I paid so the a dollar. So a little free advertising for the Richmond Times-Dispatch. <laughs> there you so go. You guys owe us. Um. I want to talk just a little bit about the uh, the newspaper industry, if we will, to kind of get going here on the podcast. And sure. we're we're going to get uh, talking about Virginia Tech football and basketball in just a little bit. But curious to get your thoughts, your perspective, just how the newspaper industry has changed, even in the last decade or so, and and where you think it could yeah. potentially be a decade from now in twenty thirty. I think the newspaper industry in its last decade or so, and also its future, could be a master's level business course guys uh it the transformation and really decline both yeah. have been remarkable and for someone who grew up it newspapering is all i ever wanted to do and it's all i've ever done and it's been disheartening really yeah. uh to to see what has happened uh, when I started at the Daily Press and the Times Herald, we had an afternoon paper and a morning paper, and we had upwards of two dozen sports writers. And when I left, there were five of us. Yeah. And it, it, it's a classic case. <clears throat> With the advent of the Internet, we gave the product away for free. And then we go farther down the road and it's like, uh oh, we made a mistake. We need to charge. We need to somehow monetize the internet because no one's advertising in print anymore and newsprint is too expensive. So now what are we gonna do? We're gonna try to charge for the internet. Yeah. But the internet's been free for so long that people don't wanna pay for the most part. So I mean, it's, it's just the, the the business model to me is irreparable. I mean, I, I don't see any way to fix it. There are certain, like I think it's the, is it the New York Times? Some some of the larger metropolitan papers are doing very well. The New York the Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, they're all doing well. They with are the doing subscription model. Yes, and 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 more in in our wheel. That's the Athletic. Yes, is is, yeah. is doing well on a subscription model, and and Andy Bitter has been working for them covering Virginia Tech football for for a couple of years. So there there are some folks out there making a run at it, but smaller newspapers such as the Daily Press, and then we we merged with the Virginian Pilot in Norfolk. Um, 
it is a rough, rough go. Th- this is a topic I could actually talk a lot about because so, I was I was the internet guy at first. You yeah. Know? And, and so there have been two stages to this. Number one was when the internet came along and uh, newspapers took a hit from that. But I think it accelerated when social media came along. And, yeah. you know, Facebook really hit in about 2005. Twitter was more towards 2010. And so, so there were there were two stages there. The just the advent of the internet and people being able to put up content for free, and then social media created this clickbait world where it just compromises journalism. You know, true storytelling in favor of can I get a person to just click and pay attention to me? And I, I know you've been on the front lines of all that stuff. Oh, absolutely, yeah. and Twitter especially. I mean, that's that's such a sp- at least where I live, it's such a sports-driven community. Sports and politics, I yeah. think, is what Twitter has has become. And I was I was slow to to recognize its potential. I confess, but I'm out there like everybody else. I remember. I still remember when I got an email. It was probably 2008. A guy emailed me, and I I, I can never remember who he is. And it reminds me from time to time on the message boards. He had discovered Twitter and he reserved the tech sideline username on Twitter for us. And he emailed wow. me and he said, you got to do this. It's, it's this platform where, you know, back then it didn't have graphics at all. And it was 140 characters. Right. He said, and you, and you just, you know, and he told me about it. And I remember thinking, are you kidding me? Who's going to want to do that? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and 15, 12, 12, 13 years later, it's a valuable tool. And of course, partly the bane of our existence. Oh, <laughs> many times. It's amazing to see the evolution of Twitter 10 years later. Like last night, the, the debate was being streamed on Twitter and the amount of people that are just on Twitter and use it for, you know, writing coverage or podcast. Yeah. And it's, you know, thinking like even just three years ago, Twitter, I think it was the star button to like, and now it's, the, it's just, it's changed a lot and it helps a lot of media members for sure. You should have seen it when it first came out and it was just a hundred, it was just nothing but text. Yeah. And then they introduced pictures, and that really angered the people who liked Twitter up until that point. They said, "Oh, now you're turning into Facebook," and it's it's incredible the way it's evolved. And like I said, it's it's a good tool, but eh. yeah, I mean, Evan, you ask about the, the the future of newspapers. I wonder if in a decade, many communities will have an actual newspaper yeah. that is delivered to the to the front doorstep. I. I I have serious doubts. Yeah. C- certainly seven days a week. I uh, would be. Well, and you already surprised. see that happening. Yeah, yeah. In a lot of community, a lot of cities where large newspapers yeah. are, are going to five day print schedules and three day print schedules, and yeah. uh, where essentially the Sunday newspaper becomes a magazine. Yeah, is, is basically what it is a weekly magazine. Yeah. Dave, one thing we wanted to talk to you about too, you know, someone as me who's an uh, aspiring sports broadcaster and journalist looks up to you, and we have so many in our sports media and analytics program here at Virginia what Tech. What a great program. You guys, <laughs> you guys are so fortunate we to, are. To, to, to have that program here. Um, Bill Roth does a great job. Yeah, he's building the heck out of it. He, 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 he really best. is. Yeah. I'm really proud to be in it. I really am. We have a lot of. Uh, we actually just launched a part of our, of our, of our a part of Bill's play-by-play class, a uh, website that's going to allow kids to go out and write and cover games. And um, so I'm curious to kind of get your thoughts of just for for young sports writers that are wanting to to start out in the industry. What advice would you give them today, at this point in 2020? Well, if if, if they're students, Evan, I I, st- I stress this whenever I talk to. Uh, aspiring journalists of, of any kind, you have to be versatile now. You can't just be a podcaster or a broadcaster or a writer or a video. You have to be, you don't have to be great at everything, but you have to be pretty fluent yep. in many platforms because Absolutely. if you're not, you're, you're just not going to be marketable enough. And that, to me, is the key. You have to be comfortable at the keyboard. You have to be comfortable here behind the microphone and oftentimes even behind the camera and just learning the technical aspects of it. And then I, I think, especially for students, is as much as you might be absolutely convinced that 
sports journalism or journalism is what you want to do. Broaden your education. Don't just stay there in that department. Get on campus. Take a religion class. Take a business class. Take a law class. Because you guys know as well as I do, in covering sports, legal stuff comes into play. With analytics, you got to be comfortable with numbers. Mm -hmm. you, you, you better be at least decent with, with with math and figures and such. And, and that's always something you've excelled in is, is digging up the stats. And, and Chris Coleman's nickname is actually Statty. Stat <laughs> so, you know, that was kind of his. And I remember when I was a kid, you know, Julius Irving would start out, you know, three of 12 from the field. And I think to myself, how many shots in a row does he need to make to get back up to 50%? 50%, yeah. Yeah. So I've always been comfortable with the numbers. Yeah. And I, and, and I think that's essential. And uh, it's it's fun to share those those kind of. I mean, that's where Twitter is the ideal yes. yep. avenue, because you know you come up with these cool little nuggets, and can you drop them into a column or a story? Are they even a complete story? Maybe not, but you throw them out there on on, on Twitter, and you inform people, and you get retweets, and you get followers. Yes, you do, <laughs> and then more yeah. people read your actual uh, <laughs> columns and stuff that you write. At least that's a theory. Yeah. <laughs> So, let me, uh, so you were talking about being versatile, and, and that, that hits close to home for me because um, I remember when we hired Ricky LeBlue, Ricky started telling me, you need to do a podcast. And you and I talked before the show, neither one of us listens to podcasts. Yeah, not and a I, lot. I remember he was telling me that, and I was like, eh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a writing snob. I got into this business because I like to write. Mm -hmm. And I have learned in the last literally two to three years from doing a podcast and now doing this video and putting it on Facebook and YouTube, it all works together. It does. And, and so that's a great piece of advice. You have to be well-versed in, in a number of different arenas and ways of doing things. And I think, Bill, when I look at the sports media and analytics, it looks like Bill is taking more of a broadcast journalism focus in the program. But I think he also gives kids opportunities to write and you know, Evan comes in here and does the podcast. And so I agree with you. Just dip your toe in a little bit of everything. And and, and Bill is one of those journalists. And yes. and, and obviously he, he's a broadcaster first. But I remember the columns he used to write mm -hmm. when when he was text play-by-play -play guy. Bill knows his way around the keyboard now. Yeah, this is going to sound like a random example, but I remember in 1994 when Virginia oh, this Tech— this is random. Yes. <laughs> when Virginia Tech—I actually researched this one time for a story. So um, when Virginia Tech did not get invited to the NIT in 1994, they got invited in 95 and won it, and 96 right. was the NCAAs. In 94, they had a very good record in basketball and didn't get an NIT invitation. And I remember the column Bill wrote for uh, the Hokie Hustler— Hutler. And he shredded the, air quotes, selection committee for the NIT. He picked the example of uh, Southern Miss, who Tech had beaten them twice. And, and, and it was just very well constructed. So Bill could make a living writing. Yes, he could. Yeah. So Absolutely. I completely agree. I think yeah. that's what I, yeah. And he still writes. He does. I have Roth Report online. I mean, he, uh, so, yeah. yes, absolutely. And, and Evan, let me, let me ask, ask you a question. How much of, a, of an asset has the ACC network – and its studios been for that that sports and analytics program that, that that you guys have. It's it's been a really really big asset, especially for we have a lot of kids in our program who enjoy being behind the scenes mm -hmm. and wanting to the, produce. The and, and, the, and so there was a uh, baseball game that I, I was fortunate enough to call against uh, midweek ETSU last week, and it was all student produced behind the scenes. And then myself as a student was on there, and it was completely, it was on the ESPN app, ACC Network Extra, and it was all produced by tech students, yeah. uh, which was which was really cool. So it's it's provided avenues to get on the air and do play-by-play -play and to work with others, and then then behind the scenes, too. You, you, you guys would be amazed at how many kids are, you know, on camera and are on graphics and score bug and I mean it, it's it's really fascinating. What so it's an amazing opportunity moment. for young people. That's a heck of a sandbox to play in. It really yeah. is. Yeah. And it's you know it's a, it's the shiny new toys too, and it's all new equipment. And the studio yeah. is you've been in the, uh, the I sure the, have. I mean it's it's incredible what they've built in the south end zone. So. Um, in the old media room. <laughs> that's right. I forget that that's where that yeah, was. That's a, the old interview room. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, we're so glad to have David Teal a part of the Tech Sideline podcast day today. We record on Wednesday morning, February 26th, episode 121. 
And I want to transition to uh, the hard one and talk a little bit about, uh, you know, we are in the middle of February and we're in the middle of uh, college hoop season. Tonight, Virginia and Virginia Tech will play. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But, David, as we transition to basketball, I want to start by talking about Mike Young sure. and his first season as the head coach of the Hokies. Uh, so many ties to Southwest Virginia. Oh my gosh, you know, he yeah, talks about how his, his first game he ever saw was in Castle Coliseum. I think he said 1971. I want to go back to when he was hired, though. What were your thoughts of when Virginia Tech tapped Mike Young to be the next head coach at Virginia Tech? Well, let me take you back even further to 2012 when Jim Weaver fired Seth Greenberg. I got a phone call from Ernie Nestor. Ernie is currently on Danny Manning's staff at Wake Forest. He's been a head coach at George Mason and Elon. And Ernie was an assistant at James Madison when I was a student there in the early 80s. So we've known each other for a long time. And he called me when the tech job came open in 2012 and said they should hire Mike Young. I said, really, tell me why. And Wofford had been to a couple NCAA tournaments under Mike at, at, at that time. Yeah, he was time. still building it at that point. Yeah, I mean, yeah. They, they'd been to two of the previous three, I believe, in 10 and 11. They, they, they had been to the tournament. Hadn't won a game. But I said, okay, tell me why. And, and he just told me what a great X and O coach he was, especially on the offensive end. And that he would be a guy who would, because of his Southwest Virginia roots, he would treasure this job. This would be his destination job. And obviously, uh, Jim ended up hiring James Johnson, and then Witt ended up hiring Buzz Williams after that. But each time the job would come open, my phone would ring like clockwork, and it was Ernie Nestor. They should hire Mike Young. So did you talk to him when they finally did hire Mike Young? Yes, as as a matter of fact, because... I was at the Final Four in Minneapolis with Virginia when when they hired Mike, and I couldn't be at the press conference. Yeah. But I wanted to write a column about the hire. So I called I called Ernie. I said, okay, all those conversations we had off the record, now let's go on the record. And, and that was the, the column I wrote based on, on my interview with, with Ernie that day. So th- that's a very long-winded way, Evan. I'm sorry. No, that's uh, a great story. Uh, yeah. of, of saying, I thought it was a hell of a hire. And I still do. Because you'd been prepped more than anybody else had by yeah. somebody calling you for years saying they need to hire Mike. Yeah, so, somebody Mike I respect. Yeah. Somebody, I mean, Ernie was on Dave Odom's staff at Wake in, in the Duncan era. Yeah. And so he's been around. He knows quality coaching. And so, no, I, I thought Mike w- w- was a terrific guy. And I remember watching Wofford against Kentucky. In, in, in the NCAA tournament last season. Yeah, unfortunately, and, I didn't get a chance to see that. I it was a great game. It came it. down the stretch. I it, watched it, too. It yeah. absolutely did. And I saw them in the Southern Conference tournament. And just the way they spread the court and the way they shot threes, and you're like, these guys know what they're doing. And they got some players and was, was just really impressed and have been so this season. And I, I know the Hokies have hit the wall in my mind inevitably so it's just yeah. a young group and a couple guys who reclassified so are basically high school seniors trying to play a 20 game ACC schedule so Michigan State notwithstanding I've all along thought you know they're, they're gonna they're gonna hit a slide I was here. hoping it wouldn't be this bad you know yeah, but no I I understand yeah. but still I I think he's done a commendable job I think it is a destination gig for him. I, I, I don't think I've ever seen anyone so grateful to have a job, a, a specific job, as he does. And that's kind of cool to see. And be well qualified for it at the same time. <laughs> exactly. So, so, you know, when he was hired, uh, I, I tend not to pay much attention to anything other than Virginia Tech Athletics, so I, I was kind of clueless. But uh, – um, I lived in Radford for, for five years when I was a kid, from basically kindergarten through third grade. And so uh, then we moved to Charlottesville. So my high school years in Charlottesville were Ralph Sampson's uh, college years. Wow. Freshman, so yeah, that was a lot of fun. 
And, but also, at that point in time, the state Final Fours in basketball were being played at University, University Hall. Hall. So, you know, I still knew all those guys in Radford. Now, Mike is two years older than me. He's my sister day, sister's age, not my age. But Phil Williams and I were the same age. And, and I knew some Bev and Richie Davis were buddies of mine. And when I was a sophomore in high school in Charlottesville, Radford came to the state, state Final Four. And uh, Phil was a sophomore that year. Mike was a senior. Huh. And I do not remember him. I don't remember that team very well. I remember they lost to uh, Harrisonburg and Pee Wee Barber, if you remember Pee Wee oh, Barber. Oh, I absolutely do. Yeah. Um, and then they came again two years later when I was a senior. Of course, by that time, Mike was gone. But uh, it's just interesting. I, I mean, surely you have these thoughts of, I wish I had a time machine. You know, yeah. so I could go back and, and relive this moment. If I'd known in 10th grade, sitting there watching a Radford High School basketball game, that Virginia Tech's future head coach was on the floor, how that would have that? been an interesting little thing to know. <laughs> yes, you know? very much. Uh, how about, you know, you kind of alluded to it being his dream job, but so far just in year one, how he has kind of fit at Virginia Tech and the way that he interacts with the fan base and the student section and... You know, he's buying pizza for students lining up at five thirty. Just your thoughts on how he has fit so far in year one. I think the quintessential Mike Young image or photograph is him sitting on the bench eating popcorn before <laughs> the a game. Popcorn thing's hilarious. I mean, how 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 great is that? Mm -hmm. He's just a guy watching hoop. <laughs> I mean, he no, I, I I think he's I think he's an ideal fit, and I I think the fan base has embraced him, and rightfully so, and and will to a greater degree as as the program progresses and yeah. I, and I believe it will. Yep. Yeah. No, he's I love the popcorn thing too. They asked him about it on the uh Packer and Durham last week. Oh, did they? What was his answer? He said that he, he made very sure to say Tech had the best popcorn. <laughs> but he said the best road <laughs> popcorn road. is Boston College. That yeah. they uh apparently word got through the BC and they they had freshly popped popcorn ah, for him. Well played Boston <laughs> College. So, anyways, it's a uh it is it is very cool to see that because I think a lot of times in basketball the, the head coach doesn't come out until like the last minute mm -hmm. but to see him on the floor an hour 15 hour before he's just he's, you're right he's just having a just good hanging time out. and yeah. it's a popcorn and a diet coke i can't forget that he is a big diet coke fan i believe so most yeah. coach most coaches can't get by without their relentless uh <laughs> caffeine fixes yeah. especially for those nine o'clock tips yes like the miami game last mm -hmm. week um so tonight the Hokies uh play uva mm -hmm. second time this year uh, they played early back in the ACC slate, but just overall thoughts for our viewers watching uh, on the game tonight and your expectations for the Commonwealth Clash. Now, let me jump in here and say, don't forget to throw in that stat that you looked up right before we went on the air. Yeah, I, I, I will. If Tech has four games yes. remaining, right? two home, two away. Two home, two away. If not tonight, when? I mean, tonight is when I expect Virginia Tech, and, and I know they're tired, and I know they're on a slide, and they've lost seven of their last eight. But tonight is the night I just expect the Hokies to – I think the effort's going to be supreme. I think Castle's going to rock. I don't know if they're going to win. I kind of doubt it. But I, I just think they're going to play well. I don't think we're going to see a repeat of what happened in Charlottesville. I don't think we're going to see a repeat of what happened at Cameron the the other night. T t to me, that they've got Clemson at home. They still have to go to Notre Dame and Louisville. T t but home against UVA, I mean, I think tonight is the night that everyone on that team is probably pointing to her. I, I expect a heck of a performance tonight, win I, or lose. I think it helps that it's a 7 o'clock game as opposed to 9 o'clock. Yep. Um, and one thing we've talked about on the podcast is that despite the losing, the, the turnout has still been good, and the fans mm -hmm. are still engaged, students are still engaged. So I think you're right. I think it's going to be a good atmosphere. Yeah, right? and you, you referenced the stat we, we looked up earlier bef before we started recording. Dating back to 2008, I believe we went, Virginia Tech has defeated Virginia nine times by a total of, what do we say, 28? 27. 27, 27, 28 no, 20, points. I think it was 28. My brain turned it into 27. Yeah. Something but, like that. But by an average of about three points per game, and six of those games went overtime. Yeah. 
So when, when the Hokies beat UVA in the last decade, they are epic. It's tight, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah no blowouts. Um, so, again, that's tonight at 7 o'clock, and I'm, certain, I'm sure – People would love to see an overtime game, you know. Not, <laughs> added, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I have any more overtime games in me. <laughs> That's very true. Yeah. But that, that, that game last Wednesday night Oof. just yeah. – what was it? Tech's first triple overtime game since the – no, 83, I want to say. And then it was the first triple overtime game in Miami history. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 And that game did not end past midnight. I think it was like twelve oh one, twelve oh two. Wow. It was a it was a late game. I, what Tyree Stratford played over fifty minutes in that game. I think he played fifty game. even. Oh. Yeah, when we talked about it the other day on the podcast, I, I said I could feel going into the third overtime that that, that the fans were done. They yeah. they got quieter when they realized they had to go through a third overtime and, and I was just thinking about the players thinking, Man, what what must they mm. feel like? You may, you mentioned Tyree Stratford just just real quick. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Guys, I love his game. Yeah, yeah. He's a lot of fun. Oh, he is. And his ability to to, to go to the rim and finish with either hand at, at, at that young age, I th- I think is exceptional. I you know, he's he's undersized, but he's he's tough and I think he'll grow a, a, as a shooter and you know, between him and Jalen Cohn and and Naheem Alina I, I like that core. That and there's got. more coming. Yep, yeah. More guys coming. Yeah, and, exactly. And I think uh, as the team gets better around Radford, the things that he does well will get even more deadly. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and Mike's talked about he need, he says we need more post players. We need guys that I can – he specifically said the other night, we need guys I, I can crash the offensive glass with. Can you imagine Tyrese Radford on the offensive glass with – Kivaluma, yeah, or, yeah. or a, a developed John Ogiaco. Right. You know, this is it's 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 going to yeah. get good. Yeah. So our colleague Chris Coleman is not with us this morning. He always says that one of his favorite basketball players in Tech history is Jamon Gordon. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, yeah. Do you think Tyrese Radford's the kind of guy that ten or fifteen years from now that Tech fans will remember? Oh, do you remember Tyrese Radford? Do you think he can have that kind yeah, of career? I, I think he can. Mm-hmm. I, I I really do, just because of his impact on. On, on both ends, just the way he plays, I no, I I, I think that's a, a, a terrific comparison. I'm telling you, man, I don't think a 20 rebound game's out of the question. He's got three something. more years to do it for a six for a six one dude. And yeah. I think his career high is uh, 13 this year against Wake Forest. I want to say, you know, Jamon had 16 one time. Did he really? Yeah. I think I think it was also against. Might Wade. need that triple overtime game to get to. In, in All right, else. there so, you go. Um, I, I, I didn't qualify in any. Just saying, twenty <laughs> rebound game. <laughs> that would be unbelievable. Last thing I want to talk about for basketball because we do want to transition to football. Just reflecting on year one for Mike Young though on the basketball floor, mm-hmm. and especially what he had to do when he first got the job. Can, can, re- re- recruit his team, you right? Mean? I mean, <laughs> right? What, can you put into perspective just how? much of a challenge he faced when he got here and losing obviously the guys to graduation and Jay Rob and Med Hill, but Nikhil going pro just yeah. the, what he had to do to construct this roster. Right. It, the fact that he got Nolly to stay was obviously extra large and it would have been even bigger if, if KJ had, oh, yeah. had, had, had stayed. I mean, I don't think it's a stretch to think this is an NCAA tournament team with with Kerry Blackshear. I just think everything that he brings to the floor um, would have n- not just the interior presence, but the experience and the, and just the sage presence and and the rebounding and his, I mean, and he's a shooter as, as well. Uh, I think it would have been a, a an even more fascinating year. Um, but you know, I I still think that what they've done is 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 pretty impressive. They may they may well indeed be headed to Tuesday at the ACC tournament, which is not where you want to be. And I think it's very much up in the air as to whether they can scratch an NIT uh, bid. But I I think if, if if the NIT were on the horizon for them in year one, that'd be a be a win win for everybody. Yeah, yep. <clears throat> Again, we're so glad to have David Teal here on episode 121 of the Tech Sideline podcast. Malcolm Stewart, Will Stewart along with us as well. Transitioning now from basketball, talk about some uh, some hokey football. And I want to start with, I was preparing for the podcast and I was 
like thinking to myself, wow, hard to believe Justin Fuente is entering year five mm-hmm. as head coach of Virginia Tech. I feel like it was just yesterday that the news was breaking. They were hiring him, and now it's year five. During the Virginia game, That's by right. The way. <laughs> That's when that broke, right? Oh, that's year. right. I forgot about that. Yep. Uh, I, re- I remember I was actually standing on the hill when I got that ESPN notification. What an um, awkward, awkward afternoon that was. But that's that's another story. <laughs> Looking at this program the last four years, mm-hmm. how would you evaluate Virginia Tech football and the job that Justin Fuente has done now entering year five? That's a podcast in itself, yes. isn't it, guys? There's, there, there's, there's so many components here. But I'll start with this. And Frank Beamer's final four seasons, how many times did they win eight games? Once. Once, that's right. They've won at least eight games three times in Justin Fuente's first four seasons. If Justin Fuente had taken the Baylor job, would you have said he left the program in better shape than it was when he took it? I would say absolutely yes. Yes. Mm. So that, that's where I would start. Now, are there other components to examine? Absolutely. Has recruiting gone as well as you would hope? Absolutely not. And clearly not as well as he would have hoped witness the staff overhaul this offseason. Right. I think that was absolutely rooted in recruiting. Uh, is there an odd disconnect? between Fuente and Virginia Tech fans. I believe so. And I think Fuente gets that. I think he understands that. And I think part of it, we're all products of of our environment. And if, if you look at the FBS programs where Justin Fuente has worked, he was the head coach at Memphis. Okay, Memphis football, no offense intended, is not that big a deal in Tennessee, okay? Volunteer football is a big deal. The Tennessee Titans are are a big deal. The Nashville Predators are a big deal. And then he was at TCU. And again, no offense to the Horned Frogs, who had an undefeated season and beat Wisconsin in a Rose Bowl and finished number two in the country. But in Texas, where is TCU in the pecking order? At Virginia Tech, you are the team, because we don't have pro teams in the Commonwealth. Virginia Tech football is it. And the head coach is just an enormous public figure, far more than at Memphis, far more than Gary Patterson at, at TCU. And I think Justin Fuente has struggled with that part of the job and maybe it even surprised him I don't know I'd agree with that um, I'm trying to figure out how much to say here um, we've we've talked a lot I, I think he's naturally an introvert I agree you know he is uh, like a lot of people he's hardly unique in this the smaller the audience gets the better he gets down to the Agree. The one-on-one level. And I know you've interviewed lots of people for many years, but um, I'm relatively new at the whole media access thing. And I remember learning that lesson with Scott Leffler. Scott, when he was on the podium behind a lectern, was one guy. When he was talking to three or four guys, he was another guy. If you had him one-on-one, he, he was, was very, fabulous. very relaxed. So there's there's a lot of that that goes on with Fuente. And you see him at the ACC football kickoff when what? he's sitting around a table with and us. And he's at his best. Yeah. Um, but I did, I don't, I don't mind saying this. I got an email at one point, you know, when all the pressure was building during football season and, and probably the, a little the, this past season, yeah, after, like probably this, after the Duke game, it was, it was after that, but, uh, I did get an email from a, uh, an extended family member of him who said, uh, I, th- I think the way you and Chris and have talked about Justin has been very fair. And this family member specifically mentioned his personality and said, he is a very quiet, private person. He said, and he gets it honestly, you ought to meet his dad, you know? So that was some insight into, um, you know, uh, and there's a, and then this person told me the story about, uh, um, but that I told you before we went on the air about going to mass at St. Mary's and, 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 
Um, I mean, I've seen Fuente there, and he has a certain row he sits in. And apparently, uh, shortly after the Duke game, he went to Mass, and he was alone in his row. <laughs> and he told his family member, this is what happens when you lose to Duke. <laughs> so he's a funny guy. He's got a sense of humor and all that. But it, you're right. Um, he has been elevated to a point where other skills are required, and it's not necessarily easy for him. No, it, it, it's not. And he and I talked about this Last off season was not a great one for Virginia Tech, obviously, with all the, the, the transfer drama and such and coming off the first losing season since 92. And I think Virginia Tech and Fuente realized they had a little bit of an image problem. So they approached me and said, hey, you want to come out and spend a day after the spring game, but during spring, because they remember they had that week, that those few practices after the spring right, game, right? Yeah, and they said, "Why don't you come out and spend a day with it?" And I did. And he, we sat in his office and on t- first before practice, then after practice for more than an hour each time. And he was, we talked about all kinds of stuff. Yeah, and. He he was great, and 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 that story, and I don't know if I've ever told him this, but I probably should have. That story drew more page views than anything I've ever written about him or his team. Hmm. Not not the game at Notre Dame when when they came back to win, or not the ACC championship game against Clemson. That story. That's, I mean, people want to see that side of their coach. Yeah. They just do. That doesn't mean that Fuente has to become something he's not. But I, I, I think he just needs to, he's, he's like all of us, he, need, he needs to work at certain things. Well, and then, and then something happens, like what happened with the transfer portal comments. When was that, two or three weeks ago? Yeah. And he's getting raked across the coals in the national media. That's got to make a guy like him, you know, yes. okay, I touched the stove already and it was hot. I'm mm-hmm. not touching that again. Right. And how many of us, everybody raise their hand, have said something <laughs> and then immediately thought, oh, I didn't say that very artfully. <laughs> Evan's young and he, even he's done right. it. Right. Oh, and, and, and I go back and read things that I wrote inartfully or awkwardly and I didn't quite mean it that way. Yeah. And, and I think in that particular case, I think Justin, he didn't say quite what he meant. and he, It just didn't come across right. And yes, in the, the, the national media, they weren't there and they, they jumped on the quote. And the next thing you know, he's, he's getting blistered. Yeah. So, and, and I think your point is, is, is well taken that, that's that's going to make someone who's naturally reticent to begin with back off even more. Yeah. One of the other big news um, coming in the off season, of course, was who's going to take over for legendary coach Bud Foster at uh, the defense coordinator spot, and Coach Fuente taps Justin Hamilton as the new defensive coordinator uh, at Virginia Tech. So, what did you make of that hire? And what do you remember about Justin Hamilton, the football player, and his time at Virginia Tech? To be honest, not a, not not a whole lot. Remember, he got moved around a lot. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, he he was not a not an indelible player, but by any stretch. And I was frankly, I was a little surprised that that's the way, that's the direction they went uh, with with Bud's replacement. I remember. After Bud announced his re- retirement in, in preseason last year, I started making a list of okay, who, who's out there who they might look at, and you know, might they have connections to Justin or to, to Virginia Tech or just guys who are really getting it done, maybe at the Group of Five level. Never really thinking that they would elevate from within. Yeah, but. I've had a couple different conversations with, with with Justin, and on on every on each of those occasions, he has said he's going to be a head coach at Division One level. That's how much I think of him. And Fuente doesn't strike me as one to blow smoke like that if he doesn't believe it. 
Uh, See, you know. it, it wasn't a complete surprise to me because I did get an email at one point. Somebody said, hey, I ran into Bud somewhere and talked to him, and I asked, who's the next defensive coordinator going to be? And Bud said, oh, he's already on staff. There you so go. So when somebody said, but is that Bud just kind of, what is he joking or yeah. what? Yeah. So, but we'd actually, so we'd actually thought about it. We'd gone through and gone, wow, he might be talking about Justin Hamilton. So wasn't a total surprise, but uh, the, I think there was a process to, to get there. Yeah, and I and I think the fact that you know they're they're, they're surrounding him with very experienced people who who, who can help him. Um, so uh, you know, I, I think, given the tell. financial constraints, they've done a really good job assembling a coaching staff. Yes, yeah, I, I I agree, and I help me with the pronunciation of the new offensive line coach. Bill Tier. Oh, I'm sorry. Defensive line coach. Tier or, or defensive oh, line. Excuse me. Tier link. T- tier link. You're talking about a guy with some credentials now. I mean, that this, that see that was interesting to learn that um, position coaches in the NFL, again air quotes, only make about two hundred fifty three hundred thousand a year. A decently funded college program can be competitive with that. Mm-hmm. I th- would the salary eventually come out at four hundred thousand yeah, dollars or something? I think that's about right. Oh, yeah. Okay, you know, um, hope, hopefully he's got an appetite for recruiting because that's the part of the job you don't have to do in the NFL. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, that, that's 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 an excellent hire, and you know, the, I really hope that pays off. For they've him. been calling it TNT, uh, Tier Link, Tier Link and Tap. Tap, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you can't get me to talk enough about Daryl. Dar- I've yeah. known Daryl Tap for a long time. I mean, he was. He's one of the you, – you asked about my memories of, of Justin Hamilton as a player. And I said, well, you know, like, like Will said, they moved him around a lot. Daryl Tapp is one of the, one of the best players to, uh, to, to play defensive end here. And he was great with us, and he's from the 757. And I've kept up with him over the years. I don't know if he can X and O or not. I've never – seen evidence of, of that I, i'm in no position to know that but yeah. i'll bet you he'll be a heck of a recruiter yeah he'll have to grow into the other part of it he's here for recruiting yeah to begin with yeah yes and i i think he'll be quite quite effective at it yeah. so wrap it up with football right now here on the tsl podcast quickly i, I want to just get your brief thoughts on on next season for virginia tech sure Penn State comes to town, early game against North Carolina. Uh, there's a lot of high hopes for this team that returns a lot from last year. There should be, right? Absolutely should yeah, be. Yeah. I, I think Virginia Tech and North Carolina would be your preseason coastal favorites. People uh, people will jump on the Miami bandwagon. As, I, I, I think they'll jump on the UNC bandwagon because Sam Howell is yes. such a good player, I think. you know, And and Mac Brown is so good with the press mm-hmm. and there's a lot of preseason media voters down in the state of North Carolina. Yeah. I think UNC is going to be picked to win the Coastal. Yeah, and, and, and the Hokies have to go to, to Chapel Hill uh, ne- next season. And you, you, you mentioned Penn State, so a challenging game Right there in, in week two, but you know Hendon Hooker's back and the offensive line is is experienced. And oh, by the way, let's add Brock Hoffman to to, to that mix. Sure. And and most everybody is is, is back on defense. Yeah, yes, a, a, but a new coordinator and such. But yeah, I I think the the, the hopes and and the expectations should absolutely uh, be high. Yeah, and in and in in the year after that as well, you know, because a lot of the you never know with the transfer transfer portal, but he's going to have a lot of the same guys, the core of the team, the next couple of years. So, you know, this is uh, those will be years five and six, right? Mm-hmm. You know, he's gonna he's he's gonna stake his claim with with the next couple of years, I think, and we'll see where it goes. Yeah, yeah. a Penn State game that's gonna be a that's gonna be a fun one in lane. For I sure. wish Penn State was bringing back fewer starters. Yes, uh, you know. Yeah, if 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 if, if you're wearing maroon and orange, yeah. I, I I can see that. And 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 that's a game uh, that that Jim Weaver, you know, that's a series that Jim yeah. Weaver scheduled, and Jim Weaver was a Penn State graduate. And he he will be looking down on Lane Stadium that night. I presume it'll it'll be an after dark kickoff, and uh, he's going to be one proud papa watching that game. So I've been doing this a long time, almost twenty five years, and I remember 
the there was so much discussion for so many years about playing a game at the Bristol Motor Speedway. Right. And you go back to 1995. I think the conversations about playing Penn State really started in the mid 90s when Tech got good, and people started comparing them to Penn State, saying, "Oh, it's that same kind of environment. It's that same kind of you know school out in the middle of nowhere, or whatever." So that's been one that's been coming for 25 years, you know. And yeah. from what I understand, Paterno wanted no part of it. Um, so I think uh, I don't remember the timing of that announcement if that was post Paterno or, or what, but I think he was not interested in coming to Blacksburg. Yeah, I, be, I believe right. I believe it was post Paterno. Yeah. Well, let's let's keep talking about Virginia Tech football, but let's go back a little bit to talk about Virginia Tech football. Okay. Uh, the 1999 season, of course, last year they were honored uh, during the Duke game. Michael Vick was back home, but uh, they got a lot of attention here recently. Uh, oh yeah. On ESPN's uh, 30 for 30, Vick, which you were in. Uh, it was really cool to turn on the TV and see you there talking. <laughs> and uh, so, j- before we even get into it. You know, I think a lot of our viewers, I know personally I am, I don't know about you, well, I'm a huge 30 for 30 fan just to begin with. So yeah. what was it like to be in a 30 for 30 and be in that setting? Yeah, it was neat. It's actually the second one that I've done. I uh, was in the uh, Allen Iverson. I was going to say, what was the first one? Was yeah, it Iverson? It yeah. was. And, 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 and I thought that the Iverson presence in the Vic documentary was very effective. Right. I, I really liked uh, what what Allen had to say and the comparisons of Allen's influence in in the NBA and, and Mike's uh, in the NFL. Full disclosure: I have not seen part two yet. I still have it on DVR, but I, but I did see part one. But but being in it was was interesting. It's been more than a year ago since I sat for that interview. Wow. I mean, so they they worked work that time. far in advance. In advance. Well, and, it was four hours long. Yeah and, yeah, and the production takes that long, and it was crazy. They they rented this house in a on a real narrow street in Hampton, and it took my GPS all kinds of turnarounds to to, to find it. And then I get there, and they've got all. Because they want the lighting just right. They've right. got they've got all the windows taped shut and j- just a very it was kind of weird. So walking. a bigger production than the TSL podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> just, j- j- just a little bit, and uh, but they were you know obviously they had done a lot of research and. Well, you looked at least ten years younger in the clips you were. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. That lighting was working. <laughs> But uh, I enjoyed part one. I thought some. I thought some parts were a little exaggerated, like uh, like every time his aunt was on camera. Yeah, <laughs> Tina Vic is nothing if not over the top. Watch Teal pick his words carefully. Yes, <laughs> and and I thought, well, first of all, I don't remember Frank Beamer weeping at Michael's press conference when he turned pro per her claim. We have talked about that on the podcast. And I was openly, and, and, I, and I know she's vice mayor in Newport News, I think, right? She used to be. I don't know if she still is. Okay. Um, I probably read it in an article. Who knows how old the article was. Um, I, I thought that was a little over the top. She, I thought it was disrespectful, as a matter of fact. And you don't have to agree with me, man. Yeah. I know you're from that area, but anyway. Yeah. And I was a little troubled by, and I am not questioning the hardships that Michael had growing up in the East End of Newport News. But I, I thought that there were times when the piece, the, the documentary, left the impression that all of Newport News is this crime-infested, just run-down yeah. city, which it's not. Yeah. And uh, t- to me, that was just, I don't know, it felt a little overstated. That's you talk about being a fan of the thirty for thirties. Um, I think I think they tend to be and, and I first started thinking this when I watched the one about the U, which was done by Billy Corbin, I think is his name. Mm-hmm. Billy Corbin's a Miami graduate slash filmmaker. How do you think he's gonna present the U? Right. You know, and so it, I think it depends upon who's making it and, and what Agenda is a very strong word. What their agenda is, I, I, I think sometimes the the um, 
30 for 30s can be a little over the top or tell a different story than what people from the outside yeah. think. I thought for the most part in, in, in the first two hours that Michael came across very well. I know some people question because he, again, we, we, we talked earlier about how you might say something inartfully that he, he, he said something along the lines of, if I just stopped a year earlier, Meaning the dog fighting, right. you know, the, the the kind of the feeling was, oh, he doesn't really regret the dog fighting. He regrets getting caught. I I don't. I really don't think that's the case. Yeah. I th- I think he's just looking back and, and doing a lot of what ifs in, in in his mind. And I think his actions since leaving Leavenworth speak far louder than that one sentence. Yeah. We said, you know, after, after watching it, I, I said, where's the effect of when, when you look at him, just the tremendous amount of personal growth. Yes. He's still a, he's still a relatively young man. He's not even 40 yet, right? He's right around that age, you mm-hmm. know, but you can, when you just look back at what he was like when he was 20, you know, and, and the, the difficulties he had in interviews and expressing himself and he yes. was very, uh, just a different person. Yeah. I, I thought, thought he was quite polished. Yeah. Staying on the topic, you know, for me, someone who was three months old in 1999, stop! <laughs> not, not getting to really experience that game that season. Oh, so so Malcolm went to see Vic's first game in Lane Stadium. He was eight months old. Wow! <laughs> it was uh, it was really fascinating to see, you know, like the old footage of Virginia Tech in that film, and yeah. uh, to kind of look at it from from that perspective one thing i'm curious about because i, I actually really enjoy the work of uh bomani jones of espn who was in, in the 30 for 30 and listen to his podcast but you know he was uh, he was live tweeting when part one was coming out right. and i'm not going to totally paint this on him i really want to just ask the, the broad question about this the 1999 virginia tech team sure 21 now years removed how do you think it is perceived on a national level, that that team, and part of the reason I'm asking this is because he was going. Some tech fans were tweeting at him, and Bomani was of the opinion that Michael Vick was that team. He got them to the national championship. It was a almost like a, to the effect of a, of a Cinderella getting to the national championship. When you look back on that 1999 team, what made that team so good to get to the national championship? Well, as, as tech fans. Well, no, the defense was exceptional. I mean, led the nation in, in, in scoring defense. And, you know, Corey Moore and John Engelberger and Corey Bird and Jamel Hawks and, or, yeah, Jamel Smith and Michael Jamel Hawks. Smith and, and, and Michael Hawks and uh, just, a, just a lights out defense. But nationally, the perception was it, it, it's Michael's team and he was the show. And I understand that 21 years later, that would be the primary national impression that, that, that people would kind of forget what a just a exceptional group they were uh, on offense. And they also had some weapons other than Michael. And sure. Andre Davis could go could go catch some balls. And uh, it was it was a heck of a lot of fun. It was to, to, to cover. That's for sure. It was just a wildly entertaining time and team to to be around and and we had talked about this before um <clears throat> you, you go look at that schedule and uh with the exception i think of the uh wvu game you could have plugged al clark in at quarterback and that team would have gone undefeated the the it was the wvu game that michael yeah. made the difference oh my um, gosh. now yeah. you can also argue the pit game i don't know if you remember that one that ended up being 30 to 17 Tech had 10 sacks in that game. Yeah. Wow. But Pitt's quarterback, whose name I don't remember, Terman? John Ter- may have been John Terman. Okay. He threw for close to 400 yards. That game was – Dicey. You know, yeah, it, it, a little bit. And, and Vic made some exceptional plays in that game, so maybe you can argue that one. But, you know, I, I agree that uh, that team had a really good shot at going undefeated, even with somebody else at quarterback, because, you know, that they were just they were just peaking. You know, they'd done such a good job getting under the radar of guys. Corey Moore was nobody. Right. And then he wound up being defensive player of the year. Yeah. You know? I didn't realize he was a JUCO prospect. Yeah, JUCO yeah. from Mississippi. 
Yeah, he. Re- I don't remember where he originally committed, but uh, the coach quit, so he said, "I'll just go the JUCO route." Yep. So he he was a qualifier and all that. Oh yes, out he absolutely was. And he, he he's a smart guy. Um, so he just went to JUCO for a year just to you know continue playing football. And Charlie Wiles dug him up, I think, and and got him up here. Yeah. And not to not to bring up a, a, a sore subject by any mm-hmm. means for Tech fans, but I one thing that was really again interesting to me, as someone who's learning a lot about that team, was. I didn't realize how good Florida State was. Yeah. That team. You, know, you look back on it now, 21 years removed, or I guess it was 2000, so t- uh, 20 years removed. When you think back about that Florida State team, what stands out 20 years later? And Well, Pierre Warwick is, 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 is who stands out, yeah. that's for sure. I mean, yeah. he was the MVP that night, and, and, and Tech had, had no answer for him. But Chris Winkie would go on to win the Heisman the following season. Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And old man I mean, Winky. Heck, even their even their kicker was was, was a. I mean, Sebastian Janikowski. Janikowski. Yeah, he he was. Yeah, he was quite the phenomenon. Yeah, and Winky was. I, they, they showed the graphic. 27? Of Vic, who was, what, 19? Yeah. And then when he was 27, I want to yeah, say, that was yeah. the age comparison between the two quarterbacks. And then Corey Simon, I believe, was one yeah. of their defensive linemen who was really good. Um that team, you know, it was it was Bowden's second national championship, right. but it was his first undefeated team, hmm. and, and and actually it was his only undefeated it, team. And I think you could take that team and plunk them down into college football today, and they'd still be really competitive. Yeah, and that's how talented they were. I think ESPN did a ranking of the best national champions last year from top to bottom, like going back to the fifties or sixties. And that Florida State team was in the upper third. I want to yeah. say, yeah, that was a really good team. So, uh, all right. So, uh, we have one one more question before we get to some fun questions that we have for you, okay. uh, David. Uh, uh, kind of getting close to wrapping things up here. Episode one twenty one of the Tech Sideline Podcast. Want to ask you about the job that uh, Whit Babcock has done as the athletic sure. director at Virginia Tech. He's been here since two thousand and fourteen. How would you evaluate the job he's done since taking over for the late Jim Weaver? And kind of a broad question, but what do you think is next? for Whit Babcock in Virginia Tech Athletics? Well, let's start with your your first question in the job he's done. Imagine yourself taking this job in 2014. You know you're going to eventually be hiring Frank Beamer's replacement. You know you're probably going to be on the clock very soon for a basketball coach. So he, he, he knew that coming in. And then to almost immediately land Buzz Williams and to, to, to reap the benefits of that hire. Now, did Virginia Tech overpay for Buzz Williams? Did it compromise itself fi- financially there? Maybe. Were the benefits enough to say, to justify that overspending for Sweet 16. I think it's still paying off. Yeah. Even though he's gone. Right. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, I think that was, that was an am- it was an amazing hire, one no one saw coming, and was Buzz high maintenance? Yes. <laughs> Is Buzz high maintenance? He hasn't changed. He's still high maintenance at Texas A&M. But you can't argue with what he produced here. Oh, there's that question. Did he leave it better off than when he found it? <laughs> yeah. 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 Not in the moment. There was no roster when he left, but right. overall, yeah. Yes, he, he, he absolutely did. And so I, I think Babcock gets an, gets an A-plus there. I like his hire of Mike Young. You know, I think we'll see on on Justin Fuente. I I still think the hire looks look, looks good. Is it out of the park? No, uh, but might it become that? Sure, uh, we'll we'll see. Um, facilities can continue to improve, but there's still work that that needs to be done. I think you ask what's next. You know, what's next for Castle Coliseum is to me the the big question and I've asked Witt on a couple of different occasions as he envisions this rebuild of the Coliseum would it be a situation such as Clemson where Clemson had to relocate yeah. for a year and play in Greenville um, 
but 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 overall, I mean, I think his his financial stewardship has been good, maybe maybe not great. I mean, it's an ACC school; finances are limited. You know, they they're they're trying with 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 the drive for twenty five. They've overhauled the the Hokey Club and 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 the fundraising apparatus and and, and tried to modernize that. But that takes time. We'll, we'll see how it plays out. Yeah. I think what's next for tech athletics, it's it's that. I, I think that in my conversations with people over there, the Hokie Club is going to be more and more under control of the athletic department. They will still report to Charlie Flieger and, and actually get paid by the university side of the house, is my understanding. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes these communications aren't precise. Right. Um, but the way they operate, I think the athletic department will have much bigger say in that. So that's important. That's critically important because, you know, Witt himself says, where's the money going to come from? You're going you're gonna to get some additional money from the ACC network, you know, probably not a lot. Um, you're, you're not going to make a whole lot more off of ticket sales and, right. you know, luxury boxes and things like that. It needs to come from the network and come from fundraising. Yeah, and and I I I think will your, your your point is well taken that it would probably remain separate from the athletic department just structurally because yeah. that way they can operate with without public records requ- requests. Ah, yes, seriously, I think it. I think that's a consideration. I think they like it that way. Yep. Really great discussion here on this uh, special episode of the Tech Sideline Podcast, episode one twenty one with David Teal. We're going to step aside. For a quick break, brought to you by the Fisher Law Firm. And when we come back, we've got some fun questions for David Seal mm-hmm. to close Uh-oh. out the podcast. This is episode 121 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, brought to you by the Fisher Law Firm. Welcome back into episode 121 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, brought to you by the Fisher Law Firm. We're so glad you could join us on this Wednesday morning, February 26th. Will Stewart, Evan Hughes, the best producer in the land, Malcolm Stewart, and our special <laughs> guest, David Teal. Welcome back. Uh, Will, before we get into some fun questions, we've got another great uh, discussion Serious point. Question. <laughs> let's, let's, let's talk about the craft of sports writing. Sure. Um, everybody, fans, fans want answers for things that they see. How do you as a journalist balance getting as many answers and getting as much information you can uh, at the same time building trust with the interview subject? And specifically a guy you've built a lot of trust with is John Swafford. Um, I, I have. Oh, I, I know he's in your phone on speed dial. <laughs> I, he, I might have the commissioner's cell phone. Yes. He, he seems to trust you more than anybody, really, I would say. So just kind of talk about how did that, let's talk about that relationship specifically because you can use it to answer yeah. the larger question. Well, I, I, I think, well, it, like all those types of relationships, they evolve. Yeah. And they, they see that they can trust you. Um, t- to me, the, the, the key is being interested and being prepared. When you sit down with John Swafford, you know, you're talking with one of the Power Five commissioners. You don't want to waste his time right. with simpleton questions. You, you want to know the issues. You want to ask insightful questions. And if he says, hey, can this be between us, and you think it doesn't compromise you or the story you're working on, then you agree to it, and then you don't use it, and he sees that he can trust you on that. Or just in when an interview is kind of over and then you have casual conversation and you, you just de- develop this, this comfort uh, with, with one another. And I think, I think that's a, it's, it's interpersonal relationships more than anything else. It's just like we're sitting here talking to one another. I think that's the, the, the big key and yes I are there times when I've taken John Swafford to task absolutely did that make him happy probably not he never voiced that to me there are other sources who are a little more open about voicing their displeasure but um, I've I've found him terrific to, to, to be with he's accessible and I've and, and frankly I've found wit 
to, to, to be the same way. Um, he and I pretty much hit the ground running, uh, if only because uh, when I was a student at James Madison and a, and a reporter, his daddy was the baseball coach and spit tobacco shoes on my or spit tobacco juice on my <laughs> shoes. As a little accidentally, I hope. Oh no, absolutely not. We were in the dugout doing an interview, and he absolutely on purpose spit on my shoe, and it was basically my initiation <laughs> in, in, wow. in, into college baseball. And when I told Witt that story, he said, "Yep, I can see that happen." Sounds like my dad. Yep. <laughs> That's great. Good. Okay, cool. All right, so as we do on uh, every podcast, David, we, we close with uh, some questions, which uh, I, I wanted to turn in some fun questions for you. Sure. So we went to our boards on techsideline.com. We posted on Sunday that you were coming aboard. We got a lot of feedback, and I was able to limit it oh, to good. four. So mm -hmm. All right. uh, some really good questions here. Uh, so I'm going to start with Old Line Hokey. He wants to know, what's your favorite college football or basketball stadiums that you've been to, and it can be anywhere from Division One to Division Three. I, I love the question. I don't, I don't know about you guys, especially you, Will. I love going to sports cathedrals mm. and just just places where you can feel that. I miss the old Orange Bowl. It yeah. was it was a dump, but. Think about you know Super Bowl three was played there. The game that broke my heart as a nine year old when my Baltimore Colts lost to Joe Namath, but the palm trees in the end zone and just all the the, the Super Bowls and, and national championship games that were played in in that stadium. To so uh, I was I was a Dolphins fan as a kid. Oh my gosh! So you yeah. talk about the game that breaks your heart. The one that breaks my heart is the San Diego. Yes. Overtime game where Don Strzok threw for 400 yards and Miami lost anyway. Yeah, the playoff and, game, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, where, where Kellen Winslow was Superman. Oh, uh, that's another podcast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, I never saw the Orange Bowl, but my dad traveled to Miami one time, yeah. and, he, and he, when he got back, he said, oh, I visited the Orange Bowl. And I said, to, you know, like I could hear angels singing, and I said, how was it? And he goes, it was kind of a dump. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but but to, to, to go to Death Valley, to, to LSU w w with the wow. Hokies, yeah. uh, to, to go to Southern California and the, and the L.A. Coliseum when UVA played out there, uh, to go to Nebraska with, with, with the Hokies. I mean, that was awesome. I've been to Owen Field at, at, at Oklahoma. Uh, I actually, my dad and I went to 25 consecutive Army-Navy games. Hmm. Wow. When, when I was a kid and then in, in, into my early adulthood. And one of the games we did, because there was one year where the Army-Navy game was at the Rose Bowl. And to, to, to walk into that Ooh, place. Yeah. Uh, that was that was great. Um, I'm sure um, on the basketball side, you know, Cameron, the old Carmichael Auditorium at, at Carolina, Reynolds Coliseum at NC State, the Palestra in Philadelphia, Allen Fieldhouse at Kansas. I've I've been there. Pauley Pavilion at at UCLA. Uh, just. Gallagher Iba at Oklahoma State, just those buildings where you can feel the history because of who played there and the games that transpired. Do you there. have a good memory for these trips? I mean, do you remember? I mean, you've been at this thirty some years. Do you do you have good recall on things? Pretty much, yeah. Because I tend not to, sadly. Yeah, I mean, the, the, those type of trips, I I, I do remember. And yeah. and j just to throw another one, th this was not business. This was vacation. Um, my wife and, and daughter and I went over to Europe uh, th this, this summer and uh, broke the piggy bank and spent a day at Wimbledon. Oh, that's amazing. That's that on my bucket cool. list. That it, well, oh, that's amazing. It, 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 it was on Jill's bucket list. <laughs> and she said, do you think we can do it? I said, heck yeah. Let, let, you know, this this is a once in a lifetime deal. while the tournament was going on. Oh yeah, oh That's, that is amazing. Oh, yeah. and, and and we we weren't at we weren't at center court, but we were at court okay. one, which is yeah. which is stadium court with a roof, and we had these unbelievable seats. They were better than even the players' family wow. box. Yeah. And at at the end of the night, where we thought we'd had our last match, they come over on on the PA and say. We've had a rescheduling. Coco Goff's next singles match will start in 45 minutes on this court. Wow. And we're like, 
Yes. Free tennis. <laughs> the, free, the, the 15 year old phenom for, Coco Golf. Yeah, no, no, that's no, no, a, no. yeah, not only free tennis, but maybe the, the, the next great American wow, woman tennis cool. player. So those are, I mean, I love sports cathedrals. Just yeah. love them. That's awesome. After the podcast, we can talk about Wimbledon. I'll talk about tennis for okay. all, all, all day. That, that is, that's really cool. Uh, next question is from uh, Femoyer Hokey. Femoyer. Femoyer. Where do you see college football going in the next 20 years? I, I think my answer is, is, is two-pronged. I'm fascinated to see what or how the postseason structure will evolve. Everyone seems to believe that playoff expansion is inevitable. I guess eventually it is. I, th I think it's going to be a lot more difficult than most people seem to think. It was terribly hard just to get to four teams. Hmm. And the, the, the presidents are, are, are still in control. The logistics of getting to eight are really challenging. I guess they'll get there, but I think it's going to be it, it's going to be time consuming. And then I'm I'm fascinated to see just where not just college football, but where football goes from the athlete welfare, health, safety. Um, is the kickoff going to go away? Uh, how will they continue to legislate rules? Uh, and as more and more data becomes available on head trauma, what are the impacts of of that going to be? I uh, I'm fascinated to see where that goes. Yeah, I don't I don't really have an answer for it either. Um, one thing you did not mention was the growing competitive imbalance due to the extreme amount of money that's going into the SEC and Big Ten programs in, in all sports. Um, I don't know that you can legislate to help that at all you know well the, i mean there, there, there's talk of congressional intervention in terms of limiting coaching salaries and such i don't know if we can or want it's not how capitalism to, works to, to, to go there but also you know the financial imbalance has been there for for quite some time and texas and ohio state still don't win every national championship yeah. in every sport and the acc still is a really good basketball league and Clemson is is still on the national scene and I think eventually Florida State will re return They'll figure there. It out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, money means a lot in in, in some regards, but it, it hasn't it hasn't produced maybe the competitive imbalance that you might think. Well, I, I sit here and I talk about it as if it's something new. It's not new. There's always been a select group of teams that win national championships. And that's what was so fascinating about Virginia Tech's run in 99 yeah. and the success that uh, Kansas State enjoyed for a while where they came this close to playing in a national championship game themselves. Mm -hmm. Sure. 1998, if they've just finished off – a Texas A&M team that they should have beaten in the Big 12 championship game, I think yeah. they would have gone to the BCS national championship game. But that those those are rare, you know. So like I said, I sit here and talk about it like it's something new, and it's really not. Yeah. Oh, we've got two more. This one's from Hokey Flyer. He wants to know, what's the most difficult Virginia Tech article you've ever written? Whew. I would go back, guys, to uh, – Tooth, oh, I'm going to get the year wrong. But a young woman on campus accused... Christy Broncala. No. No. This is after Christy Broncala. Okay. Christy accused football players. Roland Roberts mm. and Dennis And Dennis Mims. Mims, yeah. Yes. And I was able to obtain hundreds of pages of documents of emails between parties of the judicial proceedings here on campus and you know i actually saw that too yeah it, it was a lot to read i skimmed it yeah and uh, just i i just hurt for everyone involved in that story because each of them believed 
fervently that they had been wronged. Yeah. The woman believed she had been violated. Roland Roberts believed that what had happened was consensual. And they're young people. And you know, we'll never really know what, what happened, but it cost Roland Roberts his career here. He ended up transferring to, to Southern Illinois. Southern Illinois, yep. Um, and, and Dennis, could, I think Dennis wound up, uh, my wife is from Indiana, Pennsylvania. I think Dennis Mims wound up on IUP's roster for a year. That that might be right. He, he never played Division One basketball yeah. again. I, I yeah. do know that much. But that was, it was uncomfortable to run. I recently reread the story, and I was. It made me uncomfortable reading it because I wrote it as a narrative and what I gleaned from the documents and what happened in the room, and uh, it was, it was heart wrenching. That was difficult. I remember reading. I think it was her testimony. Yeah. It just the, uh, the. Uh. Yeah, and 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 the Broncala case was difficult, and then, you know the. the the, the Dooley and, and Charlie Moyer departures were equally uh, messy and involved NCA violations. And uh, those are, I think people sometimes get the wrong impression of, of media. Th- those are not things we enjoy. Trust yeah. me. Yeah. They, they just are not. Well, I'm sure one thing that you do enjoy is getting to interact with many people in your job, and that can include coaches. Yeah. And our final question comes from, I'm assuming, ALA stands for Atlanta, but uh, ALA Hokie 83. uh, Probably Alabama. Oh, good point. Yep. Other than Coach Beamer, he wants to know who (laughs) your favorite Virginia Tech coach has been to cover. That's actually a pretty easy one. The answer may surprise some people. Seth Greenberg was everything you could want. He was accessible to a fault. He was entertaining. He was a great quote. Uh, his his teams were were competitive and and compelling. And I just I enjoyed my my time with him. There were time guys. He would call me up at seven thirty in the morning raising hell about I can't believe you wrote that Seth I didn't write that have you re- have you read it <laughs> no but somebody told me what you wrote oh come on Seth <laughs> and I'm like and no this happened on more than one occasion I'm like coach the conversation is over call me back after you read it and then we'll chat but that it was just that was classic Seth he was so reactionary and and so passionate about his program, uh, and his his brother Brad. I, I I had known Brad from his time as this Philadelphia 76ers general manager, who drafted Allen Iverson number one, right? And back in the early nineties, so I'd known the Greenberg clan for for quite some time, and no, I I really enjoyed my my time and in, in interaction with Seth. Yeah, that but, actually doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Now he was, you know, the at the at the ACC tournament that year when after the Hokies had lost a heartbreaker to the Tar Heels in the I think it was the semifinals and yeah that was the Tyler Hansbro shot yeah, yeah. And somebody asked Seth what he thought the uh, the NCAA prospects were for Tech you'd have to be certifiably insane so that's when he said it yes okay. <laughs> certifiably insane to think that the Hokies would not get in the field and lo and behold they did not that would have been what year that would have been. Uh, I remember that was the year my son Ronan finished third in the regional Pinewood Derby because that's where I was that day instead of watching the game on the television. My story is I was at the New River Valley Mall at Pinewood Derby, uh-huh. walked into Dick's Sporting Goods, and they had the game on television, and I got to see basically the last shot. Wow. And that's all I got to see. <laughs> so I don't remember what year that was. I just remember Maybe what like I was 07? doing. Maybe 07? It could be. Hansborough's yeah. last game was when he beat Michigan State in the national championship, I want to say. Which would have been, anyways. Just that would have been 2009. Nine. That sounds yes. right. Yes. Gotcha. So somewhere in that time, 07, 08 time yeah. frame. Yep. 
Well, that is all the fun questions we have. We're just about out of time. We've gone over an hour, which I, I promised myself, Will, that we would stick right to about 60, and we've gone yeah, to about oh, an We're hour good. 20. Well. So uh, any final questions for no, you, No, I just Will? wanted to thank you for coming on. and well, Thanks for having me, guys. Spread the word of how much fun it is and encourage other people yes. when, when they are asked to say yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, this is a well, podcast we'll, we will remember for quite some time. It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it, guys. Yep. This Appreciate was a ton, a ton of fun. Thank you so much, David Teal, for stopping by. Great podcast. Again, this will be available on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Facebook. Facebook. That'll do it for this special episode, Tech Sideline Podcast Episode 121. Thanks so much to everybody for joining us. We're back on Monday with the TSL Podcast at 930. Chris Coleman will be back with us. For the best producer in the land, Malcolm Stewart, on the podcast set, David Teal, our general manager, and our founder, Will Stewart. I'm your podcast host, Evan Hughes, saying so long. Thanks so much much for listening to episode 121 of the Tech Sideline podcast brought to you by the Fisher Law Firm. Have a great week.